Okay. There we go. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I've preached from this uh, at Mitaki before. It's one of my um, uh, a scripture I really like, a section of the Word of God that I really like. And maybe, again, I'll preach from this in the future. But let's read it. I'm going to read from the New International Version. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to understand and receive your word today, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to get together as your body here in this little part of Hiroshima and Mitaki. Lord, touch each life here, Lord. Change us. Don't let us go out of this room the same way we came in. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, I really, really like anything that John writes. John was the writer of the Gospel of John. He was Jesus' disciple, but he was Jesus' really good, close friend. So he has some very unique outlooks on the love of Christ and relationships between brothers. You know, Jesus had brothers, you know, and so I think Jesus talked to John a lot about different things. And I really like the Gospel of John, and I like these letters that John wrote. And my wife and our friend, uh, we just finished studying the first four, uh, first three chapters of the book of Revelation, which I think John also wrote. And it's very, very good. But when we got to the end of the third chapter of Revelation, we thought, wow, this is all nice stuff for the church, but now he's going to start talking about prophecy. And we didn't read anything in the Old Testament about this prophecy, so we better jump back to Daniel first. So we stopped after three chapters of Revelation, and we're in Daniel now. So we can figure out what he, John is going to say in the next four chapters. Well, let's look at this, just these scriptures briefly to see how John wrote to us and what he's communicating to us and what God wants us to see here today. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he starts with, my dear children, or my little children. Very interesting way for him to write to you, to, to us, to the church in Ephesus. Well, we think that John was writing to a very young church somewhere in the area of Ephesus. So you know Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, but John also wrote maybe to that same church or to one of the churches in that area. And he starts off in the New International Version as my dear children. In some of the other versions, it is written my little children. The idea is the same. My little friends, the ones I have to take care of. So basically John was the pastor, maybe a long distance pastor, but he was the pastor of that congregation. And they were a young congregation and he really, really liked them. He loved them. And so he talks to them as his little children. John writing to the church at Ephesus, we don't know for sure, but he really had some special feelings for this church, for this congregation. And you know, most pastors do love their little children. We don't look at you as little intellectually or as little physically, but precious. You're precious to us. Just like you can, we were sitting behind Alex and his family and you know, the interaction between his daughters, you know, and they're precious to him. Huh? And, and she, they've got things going on. And dad and mom are concerned. And, you know, I'm a parent. I've got two children. And, you know, they're, they're not children anymore. 
but I still think of them as my kids. They're not little, especially my second one is not little. He's kind of big, but it's my little dear children. And John had the same kind of feeling for the church he was writing to. My little children or my dear children. But let's look at it in another way. God, the Holy Spirit, inspired John to write these words to all believers. And in one way, I want you to think, and God wants you to think, that this is God speaking to you and I here in Mitaki today as we read this word. God is saying to you, my little dear children, we know that this book is a cover containing 66 books, and it's written by authors from all walks of life, over 1,500 years, over 40 authors. And they didn't just create a story. God inspired them. And they are writing the very words of God to you and I. And what does God say to you and I? How does he address us? Hey, believer. Hey, you. He says, my little child. My precious little child. That's how God feels about us. Let me ask you to turn with me, or just one page over, to chapter 3 of First John. Look at the very first verse. What does it say? John got a little excited here about God calling him his child. And John says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is because the world does not know us is that it did not know him. But how great is the love God lavished on us. We were enemies of God at one time before we believed. But he gave us so much of his love that we are his children. We are his dear, precious children. And he's taking time to write a love letter to us. And he says, my little children, listen to me for a minute. That's what he's saying. God's writing to all believers. And then he tells us, well, before that, John talks to the church in Ephesus and he says, I have written to you. In a couple of the letters that Paul writes, we know that Paul wrote in response to a letter that he got from the believers in that area. They wrote to him asking him some questions, and he responded. And Corinthians is one of those. But we don't know that anybody wrote to John first and said, hey, we're having these issues here. We don't know that. I don't think so. We don't have any historical record that it's a response to something. We know that it's a response of the love that John had for the church. And there was all kinds of strange thinkings going on in that area. One of the thinkings that was, one of the teachings that was going on in that area was Gnosticism. The, the philosophy that says knowledge is everything. Nothing else matters. You just grow in knowledge, and that's how you become better. That's how you become uh, elite and spiritually great. If there is such a thing as spirituality, knowledge is everything. And there's nothing else to worry about. And that's one thing John was worried about, that that philosophy of just knowing more and more would creep into the church, and he was writing. So John took the initiative out of his love for the church and he wrote to them without them saying, John, please help us. John, please save us from all these terrible teachings around us. No, John just wrote to the church first. 
the Holy Spirit impressed upon John to take care of his children, his spiritual kids. A lot of times as parents, we are responsive to our children, but we take the initiative first in most cases, to take care of them. And that's how John was with this church. Well, you know that God reaches out to us first. You know, a long time ago, a really long, long time ago, when I lived in America, there was a famous bumper sticker on the back of many Christian uh, owners of cars who are Christians. And my wife, when I lived in America, I wanted to put all kinds of Jesus stickers on my car, but she wouldn't let me. No, that's, don't, don't do that. No. And uh, the one that was, I'm talking about now is, I found it. That was the, the campaign, you know. I found it. And I wonder, you know, is that okay? I thought, you know. And then the, uh, all the Jews in the Sierra, Seattle area said, we never lost it, and there was a Star of David, you know, beside it. So it was kind of a battle going on. But I found it. I guess they meant salvation. But even if the it is salvation, theologically they were messed up. Because we didn't find God. Because we don't look for God. The Bible tells us that nobody looks for God. God looks for us. God reaches out for us first. God wrote his love letter to us. God sent his Holy Spirit to find us. Yes, we may have had a need and we called out, God, if you're out there, help me, change me. Yes, but it was in response to the Holy Spirit coming upon your heart first. I'm just thinking of seeing the, the couple sitting so far away from each other here on the front row on Father's Day. How many years ago? Six? More. Yeah. Seven years ago. And both of them came here and got saved on the same day, on Father's Day. <laughs> Seven years ago. And did they come to find God? Yes. But it wasn't, they didn't initiate it. God was tenderizing their heart from years ago. Their surfer buddies were witnessing to them. <laughs> People were praying for them all over the world. And finally, they came here and said yes. But God loves us first, the scripture teaches us. Yeah. And we sing that. Old songs. I have written to you. I have reached out to you. And in this case, why is John writing to the church? John is concerned about the congregation near Ephesus. And I'm writing to you, my, my sweet little kids, I don't want you to sin. Why? It's, what's wrong with John? Come on. I, I you know, we're just having a little fun here. <laughs> no. It's not fun. Well, you know, once I become a believer, then, you know, what is sin? Well, grace is covering me. I'm saved. I'm heading for heaven. Why is this sin thing a problem, you know? It's not a problem. In John, in verse 8 through 10 of chapter 1 of 1 John, he tells us that, yes, you have sin in your life. You, you can sin. And he's talking to believers here. This is not a letter to unbelievers. This is a letter to believers. And he says in verses 8 through 10, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. So he's saying to the believers, look, some of you think that just because you got saved, sin has no place in your life and it shouldn't, and I don't want you to sin, you know. So let me reiterate that in, in the beginning of the second chapter 
of my letter here. I'm writing to you, my dear young believers at Ephesus, my lovely new brothers and sisters, please don't sin. I don't want you to sin. Why not? Because sin and God are, are things that can't go together. When we sin, we mess up the fellowship that we are having with God. Right? How about, uh, do you have a friend that you, you have a fight with? You know, arguing with? How do you feel? You don't want to look them in the eye. When you, you see them, you just kind of, you're know, going down the hall, and here they come. All right? What do you do? Oh, I forgot something. All right? What do you do? You, oh, you take another route. When we sin, God doesn't do that to us. But we kind of want to avoid looking at God in the eyes. Don't we? I do. The, the very person I need, I want to avoid. Because we're out of fellowship. But God and sin don't mix. So John is saying, I don't want you to sin. And God wants us to be aware of sin. God is writing through John to us, even today. If you've been a believer for a week or for all your life, God is saying, my child, I don't want you to sin. It messes up our fellowship. I know it happens. It happens. John said so. John was around all the disciples when Jesus talked about sin. Jesus talked about sin a lot. We don't like to talk about it. I think many pastors need to repent for not talking about sin. I don't know. When John says, I write to, the, to you so that you will not sin. So, when you do, I don't want you to, but if you do, there's something we can do about it. And we'll talk about that later. But it's very interesting in this text, and I learned this from, uh, in Japan we have a, a pastor, a retired pastor who came to this church and taught on First John for a long time and uh, he made us aware that this scripture, the change, the change takes place in chapter 2, where John is talking to individuals more so in chapter 1, but in chapter 2, John says, I write to this to you, plural you, so that you, you, plural you, will not sin. And then he goes, but if anybody does, individually you have responsibility, right? If anybody does sin, we, we, the church, as a church, we Right? So what John's saying, all of us, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. So we can sin individually, but as a church, too, we have some responsibilities. Right? We have responsibilities to take care of one another. We have responsibilities to serve. We have responsibility to evangelize. Right? We have a responsibility to give of our finances. As a church, we have to think, who can we support? Who can we pray for? So John is saying, look, church, if you sin, church, okay, he's not just saying it individually. Please make that point. We often use, we more often use this for us individually, but it's not just that. We have a responsibility as a church. God wants us to be aware of individual sins and sins of the body. Right? Okay? But you know what? Satan wants you to be aware of your sin too. Satan wants you to feel really bad about your sin. Sorry, I'm not there yet. Do you know why? Satan wants you to be aware of your sin so you'll feel really bad and you'll become ineffective. He wants you to think, oh, I did it again. I just as well give up. I, I just as well not try anymore. 
God wants you to be aware of it so that you'll take care of it, that you'll realize what you're doing and stop it so that you can get back into fellowship with him. But Satan wants to drag you down. God wants to lift you up. Satan wants to drag you down. So Satan makes you aware of it. Hey, Alex, you're doing it again. Give up, Alex. Your family's over there. Huh? He'll do that. And you start believing him. That's why we don't sin. That's why John is saying, don't. Because it's, you're out of fellowship with God, and Satan will use it to drag you down. You know, it works. You, Satan's no dummy. Right? He's, he's a lion without teeth, maybe, but he's no dummy. He knows how to whisper these dangerous things into our ears and into our hearts. So he knows you're out of fellowship with God, attack. And he will. Don't let him. Okay. If we do sin, we have an advocate. What's that word? An advocate. Ah. Well, let's look at, in the context of who John was talking to, he's talking to a group of people in the area of Ephesus, which was under Roman control. If you are a Roman citizen, you had the right, if you are accused of anything legally, to have an advocate. We know that through from the trials of Paul. If you want to find out, Paul was a Roman citizen. And if you read all the, through Acts, you can find out how Paul had certain rights. And he had the right to defend himself or have somebody come and defend him. And some of Paul's accusers were advocates. Now, an advocate is basically a lawyer, okay? A lawyer, someone who knows the legal code and everything. In that day, if you're a Roman citizen, you had the right to have an advocate come and talk on your behalf in front of a judge, right? That's what an advocate was in those days. And if you weren't a Roman citizen, and some of the people in this church at Ephesus might have been Gentiles, sometimes the Roman government was lenient and you would have the right, not the right, the privilege of having an advocate come and talk on your behalf. But let me be clear. Some of you are not, haven't lived in America, but in America we don't have a good impression about what a lawyer is and does, right? For the most part, we have a bad image of lawyers. We think they are in for the money and, you know, they want to get all they can and they'll take your case if they can fill up their wallet. And, you know, my friend was, uh, uh, his, his parents, his wife's parents lived in California. He lived in Idaho. And his parents were, were, died suddenly and he got their property in a big house. And they had quite a bit of money. My, my friend in Idaho didn't have anything, but uh, he had received their property in the will. So he thought he would get a Christian lawyer down in California. So you know, it would be better to trust the guy. And it worked out better. But still, when he called the lawyer, he was paying $100 an hour just to, for the guy to pick up the phone. $100 an hour to talk to a lawyer. So we wonder, hmm, what are, these, are these guys really on my side? You know? But in these days, when John wrote this letter, it was not necessarily a trained lawyer, but a person who would come and speak on your behalf. He would go to the judge and say, this guy's good. Right? He, you know, or he's innocent. Come on, give him some mercy. There was somebody who would come and stand between you and the judge. Okay? That's what an advocate was to those people. So they knew that word and they were going, wow. I have an advocate? When I sin? Wow. And he's going to go... To God on my behalf. He's going to defend me. You can see the word defend in the scripture. That's what he's going to do. So that's what it meant to them. It was very special when they heard that. Whoa, wow. What is God saying to all of us when he says, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We don't see the word advocate in this text but it's in other 
it, the, the NIV translates it so that we can understand it. The one who speaks to God in our defense is, we have an advocate. That's the word. And the word is paraclete. Paraclete. It's the same word for Holy Spirit, right? The one who stands beside us as our supporter, also the one who defends us. It has that meaning as well. What is God saying here to all believers? When you sin, I don't want you to, but if you do, we have one who goes to defend us. We have one who speaks to the Father on our defense. Now, let's consider again what, uh, what Satan does. When we sin, Satan is right there quick. Ah, he sinned, he sinned, ha, ha, ha. Hey, God, here's your child. Oh, look now, you know the law. You know, he sinned, you know, I mean, here he is, he did it. He, your Bible says, you know, Satan uses these half-truths. Huh? You know, you know, he wasn't supposed to do that, but he did it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so Satan goes and accuses us to God. And we can listen to Satan and feel all terrible, but it's very interesting. We have an advocate, one who stands between us and the Father. Now, advocates on earth, this is very interesting. Our lawyers, our defenders here on earth, even our friends, will argue our innocence. Isn't that interesting? Even we can get a, we can get a lawyer in America who knows we are guilty. I can remember certain trials that made, you know, TV, where we knew the lawyers knew that these people were guilty, but they defended them anyway. They went and argued the guilty party's innocence. And that's what most lawyers will do. They'll twist and make the law fit you. They argue your innocence. Jesus does not do that. Isn't this very interesting? Jesus goes to the Father and says, here's Magiko. And just like Satan said, she's guilty. Ah. No, Jesus, wait. Oh, that's what he does. He's guilt she's guilty. Yes, Father, she's guilty. Yeah, okay, Magiko. He doesn't do that. Thank God. There wouldn't be anybody out here, or up here either. Jesus goes, she's guilty, and I paid the price. How many of you saw the Lord of the Rings? Right? Oh. What did Peter do? Was that the Lord of the Rings? No, it's the wrong movie. No, that's the uh, uh, cast. No, sorry. Is that the Lord of the Rings? No. Chronicles of Narnia. Sorry. Lord of the Rings, too. Chronicles of Narnia and Peter. Right? They go to Aslan. And Aslan's there, and the witch of winter says, He's guilty. He betrayed you and his brothers. And Aslan said, Yep. But she's had to give up her right to Peter. Why? Because she's going to get me instead. And she does. And she, Aslan dies for Peter. Huh? That's what Jesus says. Yeah, they're guilty. And I paid the price. I paid the price. Jesus is the one who pays the price. He is the sacrifice in our place. We go through the New Testament. We know that sin demanded that something be paid. Somebody had to pay for the sin. Somebody had to do something so that the sin could be covered. But to really get rid of sin, somebody, something... Some perfect sacrifice had to die. Blood had to be shed. And the perfect sacrifice in God's plan came along about 2,000 years ago, and it was Jesus Christ. He is the one who died in our place. Yes, we're guilty. If you sin, go to God. Go. Okay, God, I, I know I, Kevin said, you know, and John wrote, and you said, and, but I, you know, this thing... God, yeah, I'm guilty. In Jesus' name, I come to you, God, confessing my sin. 
Oh, in Jesus' name, forgiven. We confess. Confess means to say the same thing as. That's what confess means. Okay? You're agreeing with God's word. You, you know, if you're not before you're a Christian, you argued, right? Well, yeah, I, sure, I drink until I'm sloppy drunk. Everybody does it. You don't. You're not agreeing with with indulging your your lusts. You're disagreeing. But when you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you and enlightens you and says, hey, that's not good for you. It takes you out of fellowship with God. And you agree and you confess. And God says, guilty, but you're forgiven because Jesus paid the price. Amen? When Jesus becomes our atoning sacrifice, or propitiation, that's really a Christianese word there, propitiation, and you find that in, in the King James or New King James, it's, it's the same word that means sacrifice for our, uh, here it's, it's written as one, uh, the atoning sacrifice, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He satisfies the holiness of God for us, and he did so by dying on the cross in our place. So we don't have to die for our sins. We die to Christ. We just say, okay, I'm, I give up. Jesus is the means by whom God shows the mercy of his grace to the believing sinner. Amen? So forget the propitiation and all those Christian words. Right? Jesus is a sacrifice. Something had to be sacrificed. A living sacrifice. Jesus did it. We believe in that and we are saved. And once we're saved and we sin again, we, we confess our sins, John says. Confess, and he'll forgive us. So in summary, why is a picture of my dog up there? <laughs> in summary, if you, I don't want you to sin, but if you do, don't feel like a dog. No, sorry. But bring your sin to God. You're children of God, so don't sin, but if you do, Jesus is your advocate. Come running to God. Maybe that's why I put the dog up there. He's running back to me. And he wants me to take his toy and throw it again so he can go get it. That's how we should do. When we realize our sin, we ignore Satan. Don't sit there and wallow in your muddy sin. That's what Satan wants you to do, like a pig in a pit. Just sit there, mope. Uh, John said, the Holy Spirit says to us, if you sin, run to Jesus. He'll defend you before the Father. That's it. That's it. Jesus is our advocate. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I don't want me to sin. I know you don't, your disciples tried to teach us that, and your word does teach us that. Lord, if I do, I ask that you give me the strength and the wisdom to run to you and confess that sin. Father, I want my fellowship with you restored. I don't want to listen to Satan and be dragged around and ineffective and be out of fellowship with you. Give me the strength, Lord. Give us the strength, Lord, individually too, but as a body here at Mitaki, Lord, are we doing all that you want us to do? Are we living as you want us to live? Yes, we have your grace, but Lord, are we obeying you? Is our grace cheap? I pray that it is not, that we will obey you and walk with you hand in hand. And if we sin individually and as a body, Lord, we'll be running to our Master. And we know that Jesus will be our defender. Thank you for this word. We ask that you change our lives here. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you. Thank you.